my pleasure to be a managing director of Start at Accelerator. I've had so much fun uh, and great experiences and learned so much from the great ed technologists that uh, we selected this year's cohort, last year's. I hope you'll get a chance to get to know them. Um, and it's my pleasure to be part of helping create uh, this with Jonathan Harper, whose leadership is just astounding. And I would just like to ask you to join me in again thanking Jonathan and his team and Ash and everyone at StartEd and NYU for helping put this together. So Jeff Rosen was just terrific, wasn't he? That was just an amazing, I just, but I wanted to ask him, and I will when we have our discussion, like, who's polarized? What are you talking about? Um, I don't know what that comes from. I'm in Washington, D.C. I don't see it. Um, actually, I do, and, and I have some bad news and good news before I bring out our next uh, Start Ed Talk. Johnny Taylor, Johnny C. Taylor Jr., is not with us today because of stuff happening in Washington, D.C., and uh, he wouldn't mind if I shared it. And Johnny Taylor, who at some point in time, you will have to take an opportunity to, to read, to view, uh, to hear, uh, has dedicated his life to uh, helping people in fragile communities. So that's a term uh, that was adopted by the Thurgood Marshall College Fund, which represents public historically black colleges and universities. And Johnny's the outgoing uh, president, just joined uh, another company recently, but stays on the board. And the uh, head of White House Initiative on Historically Black Colleges unceremoniously left the White House this week. And he was called to the White House to talk about how the White House could better work with HBCUs. So he felt that that was probably a better use of his time today. So that's why he's not here, but he's dedicated and passionate about what he does. And uh, if you have not read uh, about him, you should read the Wall Street Journal's uh, interview uh, with him about a month ago by black colleges need charter schools. And so, because he's not here, I told Jonathan I was gonna steal a minute of his before I brought out David uh, and to continue the conversation with he and Jeff. And so I just wanna to tie together something Jeff said and something you'll hear very clearly uh, from the fabulous David Coleman of the College Board. And this is all about learning and what we know and what we do with learning. It's a whole exercise we're here for. And it still stuns me as Jeff talked about the Constitution and the American Revolution, something that I studied and found uh, a calling with when I went to college, um, that we still have some huge percentage of high school seniors, I think a couple of years ago it was actually 65%, that didn't even know what the American Revolution really was about or when it was fought. And you know, you hear these numbers all the time. The Nation's Report Card, which assesses annually a sample of students, it's called NAEP, Nation's Report Card. That's the tool, if you will, the assessment that comes out when you might wake up to that newspaper and it says something like 33% of our kids are proficient in reading, writing, by the way, civics, geography, history, science. So I want you to think about this number as you go through your business today and tomorrow, as you go back to work, I mean, this is work, but as you go back to the other work, 35%. That's the number of students who on average are proficient in those core subjects. And so break those numbers down. Obviously, we know in more affluent areas, the numbers are up by 50, 60, but by the way, not much more. And we've had a precipitous drop of achievement in even some of our best performing students. And when you take another swing at it and look at urban, rural, those fragile communities that my friend Johnny Taylor talks about, the number's around 18, 20, even less. So what's proficiency? Proficiency is mastering an area of education and knowledge. And in fact, this entire ecosystem in education today is so exciting because the subject of mastery and competency is finally hitting policymakers, people we deal with every day, sometimes incredibly painfully. So why is eighth grade eighth grade? Why is 11th grade 11th grade? Why do we do biology, chemistry, physics in that order in most traditional public schools? Anyone know? Alphabet. True story. Because that's the order in which courses were laid out. And so these and other notions uh, really need a reality check. They need to be pushed and shoved. And really, at the end of the day, we need to make sure that our students do and are learning what they need to learn. And they have the time 
and the focus and the tools and the instruments. So if you can master it quicker, awesome. If it takes longer, but at the end of the day, education is about mastery and competency. So I can't think of anyone better to lead the next Start Ed Talk than David Coleman, who is the president and CEO of the College Board, a Rhodes Scholar, a former McKinsey and company consultant, whose, whose focus and dedication has spanned decades in education. He has put out some really bold ideas about how to crack this content nut, how to make sure that our students uh, are learning at all levels. And as you heard from Jeff, they have some amazing partnerships. You uh, will know, if you've never heard or seen David Why, uh, Time Magazine had him as one of the top 100 most influential people uh, in the country. So without further ado, David Coleman. Thank you. Thank you so much. I couldn't stand the competition. I needed less chairs. <laughs> Good morning. How are you? I have to say, that was a really nice introduction, but I consider it almost comical inviting the president of the College Board to a conference on disruption. <laughs> it's like inviting the head of the establishment. It's like inviting Darth Vader and the Death Star to a conversation about democracy and small learning communities. Um, so I have started two organizations from scratch and have that past of entrepreneurship in my life, both in the for-profit world and the non-profit world. So I know something about that. But when I inherited the College Board position five years ago, I faced a very different opportunity and challenge. This organization, this institution is over 100 years old. And standing in front of it, you know, we are responsible for advanced placement and a small known test called the SAT. And what's interesting, by the way, about the SAT, which is what I'll spend most of my time talking about with you in the 10 minutes I have with you, is that the SAT was born out of an impulse towards disruption. What was being disrupted when the College Board was founded was the evident fact that groups of colleges were recruiting from the same pools of white men to find their students, a very limited pool. And a group of colleges got together and chose to try to disrupt that by making an exam that would be open to all. But when I inherited the College Board 100 years after the ambition of that founding vision, virtually no one in our society saw the College Board as a force of disruption. They saw it instead as an institution that had hostages rather than clients. They saw it as an institution that certified inequality rather than responding to it. And the SAT fell into that. How many people do you know in our society that say, thank goodness for the SAT, it opens doors of opportunity for myself and my family? <laughs> so as you leaders think about life, that level of candor and witness will be essential in making anything good. Entrepreneurship is often talked about as if it's dreamy or visionary, and I find its true center in witnessing and candor, in telling the truth. So that's true. So what do you do? I have three ideas that have guided me as we've tried to make a change. I want to share them with you briefly this morning. Number one, the SAT should no longer be short for Saturday. <laughs> what do I mean by that? It was never a good idea that you went through high school and did your work during the week. And then all of a sudden, at the end, you had to do this different thing, which was prepare and study for the SAT to get into college. That's crazy. It's a crazy idea. It was never an, a good idea that on one day, without any practice or preparation, your future life was determined by an instrument that was unclear to you about things that are hard to change. Forgive me, but this sounds more like an instrument of, of intimidation than opportunity. So you may know that I announced several years ago, 2014, that we were going to redesign the exam itself. And let me share with you the principles of the redesign. The first and foremost is the SAT must only measure those things at the center of the high school curriculum, not at the extremes. In other words, the only thing that is fair game is that material in reading, math, and writing that you will most use again in your first year of college that is the most common and widely used because you should never do anything to prepare for the SAT. That's stupid. But what is intelligent is to prepare for college. So what does that mean about the blueprint? It means that, I, I, I'm sorry for those of you who like me love words, SAT words are gone. Why? 
what is the definition of an SAT word? Yeah, is it the most common words you will use again? No, it is quite the opposite, right? It is the words you most likely will not use again. <laughs> In mathematics, gone are those tricky math problems that look like nothing you've ever seen before. The opposite is true. You should practice the math that you will most use again and again. 80% of the math in the new SAT is around three core areas, not all of math, three things you can get good at that you use again and again in career training and college. We've added 43% more time per question on the SAT than the ACT, on the new SAT. Why? Because the worst sin of the assessment industry, of several, I might add, has been to conflate quick and smart. There are many great minds that work at a more deliberate pace, and we will do everything at the College Board with an SAT, with an AP, to push the limits of assessment to allow students to breathe and do their best work in high-stakes moments. That's got to happen. So those are the changes to the test. But those changes alone are insufficient, because remember what I said, even if this makes it more than clear what it measures, and just like the work of high school, there was still this haunting anxiety, and what was that? Other people have advantages you don't have. For a generation, the College Board said, test prep doesn't change your performance. And how many people believed us? <laughs> Nobody. How many people believed, please raise your hand, that the existence of such test preparation made the playing field unequal and gave advantages to the wealthy over those without resources? It was time to move past denial to accept that fact. And that's why we partnered with Khan Academy to provide the best of free test preparation for the world. Millions of students have answered, our, have answered our challenge to them. And you know, we did a study, because we now have the first year of data of those students who are practicing on Khan Academy. This is the largest scale investment our society has thus seen in personalized learning with a purpose. It adapts to you based on your PSAT scores. In 30 seconds, if you choose to share your PSAT information. How many of you took a PSAT, may I ask? How many of you did anything with the results? That's crazy. That's like giving a mass blood test with the aim of finding 1% who get a scholarship and neglecting the rest. You wonder why people hate tests. In the new PSAT, when you get back your scores, if you choose to link to Khan Academy, you get a personalized learning program based on your strengths and weaknesses within a minute of offering those scores. By the way, if you don't have the chance to take the PSAT, we give kids free versions of free to released forms of the SAT. If they need to use paper and pencil, they can fill in an answer sheet, take a picture with their phone of the answers. Within 30 seconds, they're linked to Khan Academy with a personalized account to practice. Testing is not fair unless practice is excellent and free. And that's why it can never be a one-time thing. You have to make it open to everyone so that through practice, the event of the exam is a show of your repeated labor, not of your sudden terror. The true aim of assessment at its finest, or sports, or anything good that we compete for, is the development of confidence, is the slow cultivation of confidence over fear, rather than the cultivation of it. Number one, the SAT is no longer about Saturday. Number two, the best things in life are free. And you've heard that already with Khan Academy, but let me tell you another story. Those few people who would defend the SAT would say things like, it'll find a diamond in the rough. Have you ever heard this argument? Kid is in a high school, lost, they get a high SAT score, we can find them and catapult them into your future. But you know what? We looked at the data, and we found that if you're in the top 10% of SAT performance, but the bottom quartile of income, please consider these young people. They are athletes who have defied the visible and invisible barriers of poverty. Right there in the bottom quartile of income, scoring in the top 10%. Over half those young people do not apply to a single selective college. Whoops. The assessment did not deliver opportunity. So we looked into it. Do you know why they don't apply to selective colleges? When you apply to a selective college, you first have to apply for a fee waiver to apply. You have to beg once more. Permission. So we worked together with our member institutions. We said, this can't be right. We're giving them a fee waiver, low-income kids to take the test for free. What if you answer us and give them free applications to college? Now any kid taking the new SAT gets four 
fee waivers with their names on them to apply to college. And that's my favorite day of the job because kids post them. One kid posted them on Instagram. He said, the college board sent me fee waivers because I am awesome. <laughs> he did not say because he was poor. And I'll tell you, that has moved me, and we have just announced a series of additional decisions. You know those score send prices? Can you imagine what it's like to be low income and only be able to afford to send your score? We always made it free to send up to four scores, four when you take the test, four more actually after it. That will now be unlimited. Those fees for students, those fees for students who are applying for financial aid, filling out financial aid services, those charges will now be waived. Our vision is a simple one. If you are low income in this country, you deserve something more like an easy pass than barriers in your way. We have got to stop asking poor young people and their families to say again and again they are poor for small amounts of money. We should instead speed them forward. And we are utterly committed to this, and the colleges have answered us. So no longer will students get just four application fee waivers to apply to college. They will be told, apply as broadly as you want. It is free. Go. Go. And the other best thing that's free is the interactive constitution. <laughs> Jeff came up here, and he said he wanted from those of you who are teachers to use the tool. He said, those of you who are inventors or technologists to help make the tool better, those of you who are investors or philanthropists do not invest in the college board, do invest in the interactive constitution. Because while it's free to everyone, Jeff has built it through extraordinary entrepreneurship. It is one of the most beautiful education tools I have seen in my too long time looking at such things. We announced that for the new SAT, on every single on every single exam would be one of the founding documents of this country or the great global conversation it inspires of liberty and human dignity. We let kids know the secret. But you know my rule, practice must be free. At the center of that conversation is the Constitution. Kids now have the tools to study it, how the language works, and they are entirely free. And that brings me to my third rule, the secret power of the College Board is to unleash the power of partners. I think one reason assessment has not fulfilled the dreams we had for it has been a lack of humility, a lack of understanding that tests alone do very little. And if the College Board seeks to be a positive force in the world, it must first acknowledge its extremely limited power. Redesigning assessments are a small part of this. Without the dignity and clarity of mind and entrepreneurship of Sal Khan and the Khan Academy, we could not be reaching millions of kids today. Do you know those students, which I mentioned earlier, who study 20 hours in this personalized way? They are on average improving 120 points on our 1600 scale, more than twice that of students who are not. A young man, Matthew Blue, I met him on his, after his first plane flight. He was not a high flyer in high school. He got 1,000 and grew that score by 200 points. He called it a godsend. The best work of the College Board is bringing out those kinds of partnerships, and that's why I'm so excited to be here with Jeff on stage. Thank you for your time and attention.